Okay, so here we go. Hey everybody, hope you're doing well. Thank you so much for tuning into Mindset Elevation Podcast. Now, I'm super stoked to be speaking to my next guest. My next guest is the co-founder of Mind Valley, and I'm sure that the listeners will know all about Mind Valley. But if you don't know, Mind Valley is a learning experience company that publishes ideas and techniques by, and I'm not just saying this, the best authors in personal growth, well-being, spirituality, productivity, mindfulness, and so much more. My guest is also an international speaker the author of Live By Your Own Rules, which is a 30-day optimal learning quest designed for transformation to help you identify, understand, and accept all the dimensions of your authentic self so that you can live an extraordinary life and make happiness a regular practice. My guest is on a mission to inspire women who feel limited by society's expectations, but I am so honored and privileged to speak with my next guest. My guest today is Christina Mandlachiani. Christina, how are you doing? I'm doing good. Thank you so much for this introduction. It's very kind. Was it accurate? Did I miss anything? <laughs> no, it's accurate. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's actually accurate. It's just that with my uh, Soviet past, I'm not used to being praised so much. <laughs> it's on, I, I'm, I'm literally blown away by everything that you're doing. And, you know, I, I obviously have been researching, obviously what you've been up to, the, the talks that you give, and I do genuinely come away feeling so inspired when you do speak on stage, you know, because your talks are easily accessible on platforms like YouTube. And I can totally resonate with everything that you're talking about. And I'm just so chuffed to have you on the show. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. No, it's good. Thank you. Um, but just before we begin, and for the listeners who may be new to this show, this show is all about expanding our mindsets and learning new ways of thinking. And my change process happened, and it was over a year ago before the podcast and the coaching business where I actually discovered Mind Valley. And that was the catalyst for me for my change because I'm here in the podcast, I'm watching the talks, and it really helped me enable uh, the transformation in my life and figure out that what I was destined for was so much more. And it really set me on my, my path. And with you, Christina, what I find really, really fascinating is, um, is, is your, your path, how you, um, progressed from things like your parties and your lifestyle to then living by your own rules. Could you just talk to us a little bit about living by your own rules and what that was and how the change came about? Yeah, it's you know it's it's not a small question to answer to be honest because it it was a process. I'm 43 right now, so obviously there's a lot of things that had happened in between. But uh, if I were to explain it in a little bit shorter way, I was. Uh, and I still am, obviously, a perfectionist or a good girl <laughs> with huge aspirations. And I guess like everybody else, when we are born, we are given this uh, easy tutorial, do these things and you'll be, do you you'll be good. So basically, we equate success to happiness. That's how we are brought up, believing that if you're doing all the right things, you'll be happy in the end, or at least that's what is assumed. So that's what I did. And uh, thank thankfully, um, my uh, natural inclinations and my ambitions were, uh, were quite in line with what was expected of me to be uh, happy. So I was okay with uh, with taking the risks, with with uh, going into areas which I didn't know, with um, having attention or going on stage. These things were fine with me. But uh, I actually never slowed down to ask what I really wanted. So as a good girl, as a, uh, the only child of my parents, uh, I, I was very careful to do all the right things and not to make mistakes in my life, in a sense. Uh, and um, it was sometime around 40 when I started feeling that uh, something is not quite right. And on one side, I have this perfect life, this, uh, as I like to call it, Instagrammable life. And on the other hand, there's this discontent that you can't even express because you feel Oh, how could I? So an example would be I, I had a, a little bit of a challenging day and I shared a message with my audience. I, I told them how how I needed help. And um, at that time, my husband Vishen was too busy with his own things and I felt uh, neglected or uh, invisible, something like that. Um, 
And I thought that my transformation was coming to peace with the fact that, you know, people are the way they are and it's okay. And sometimes you need to ask for help. But I didn't realize that my transformation was to come later because the answers that I got from my audience were a little bit shocking. They were saying, uh, why are you whining? You have such a successful husband. You should be proud of him instead of expecting him to, to drop his important stuff and help you do what you need to do. You're good. You, aren't you supposed to be a good wife and all this stuff? And it was interesting because this is the self-talk that a lot of ha- of us, especially the, the good girls and the good boys, have in our head. Uh, it's not the problem uh, that uh, I was feeling unhappy. The problem was that I was feeling ashamed for feeling unhappy with a perfect life. And that, I guess, was the beginning of my transformation because I started to, I, I tried to figure out what is going on. Why is it so? Because uh there's that's half a problem that my life is perfect why why am i not content mm. but the the real problem was how do how do i even dare to be dis- discontent shouldn't i get myself together and, and and be happy and do the thing that i'm supposed to do so that that was the start of my transformation wow because i know the the characteristics they say of being a good girl is the fear of disappointing others, fear of speaking out, uh, for fear of hurting others and always excelling. What, what steps did you take? Because I could imagine that obviously with everything going on with Mind Valley, and I know the story of hearing, you know, how it started and it was years of kind of struggle. What, what was the, what was the steps that you took? Because I can imagine that people could be talking saying, oh, it's so perfect, your life. But then again, I remember you talking on stage where you were saying that you were used to being at the back and embracing mm. that. Um, it, it must have been really challenging. That's that's a uh, that's another struggle. Uh, but you know, before I go into that, I'd like to say that it's not just the good girls because good girls have their set of problems, uh, and one of them is uh, yes, not appearing perfect in every single aspect of life. But then there are good boys as well. They might uh, call themselves a little different than good boys, but this idea of what a good boy is supposed to do to be successful, you know, to solve his problems, not just his problems, to solve everyone's problems, to be uh, okay to do everything by themselves and to, to, to prove to the world that they're worthy and they don't need help. So they, the, the good girls and the good boys have the same struggles, even if they, we express them in a slightly different way. It's the, uh, the, the essence of that is that there's this picture of what you are supposed to do and be. And when your uh, reality doesn't match that picture, there are so many different things that may happen. Uh, usually what happens is the confusion, but then how you deal with that confusion is uh, is very much, it's, it's, it's a personal journey for people. But the, to, to the question that you asked uh, about my second place, that happened later because um, part of my transformation was... Uh, rediscovering myself and uh, how it sometimes happens. You have a perfect life and everybody says you're an inspiration because you have all this, all the boxes checked, uh, business, uh, work that you love to do, uh, family, husband, children, uh, travels, everything that you need to do. And then when I started trying to figure out what I actually want, it turned out that I wanted different things. And I did uh, the most logical and the only logical thing. I grabbed a sledgehammer and I smashed everything and <laughs> now I'm putting my life back together. <laughs> uh, of course, I'm slightly joking. So I'm joking. <laughs> but uh, one of the changes that happened was that we did separate with my now ex-husband and uh, when we separated, that was another journey because I was, uh, we built Mind Valley together, um, but he always was the face of Mind Valley and, and uh, the mama of Mind Valley. <laughs> and um, when we separated, I did have, uh, I did have a process of seeing the value um, in that journey, my own value in that journey, because sometimes uh, we choose for ourselves a secondary role and uh, and when we separated, of course, there was this uh, practical question of, of who deserves what and who, who has earned what. And I literally felt in the very beginning that almost like I was at, um, at Vision's Mercy. mercy. Uh, are you uh, like, am I, am I to take care of myself now? But it, it took me a while to realize that um, being... Um, being part of the team, but not being the leader or not being the face or not being the visible one is also a role which is valuable and important. 
and it wasn't obvious to me. Uh, so it was my own process to come to to peace with the fact that yes, I m- I might have been secondary, but I was still crucial. And that was that was a a complicated journey, and not just that that I was um, crucial, but sometimes uh, we don't put enough value into into taking that position. And in in our public uh, discourse, we often talk about the leaders and the stars and the visible people and the people in the limelight. And we seldom discuss um, the role of the second in command. They somehow, we we don't even remember their names. So a very uh, simple visual example would be Lord of the Rings. And everybody knows Frodo, whereas if you know the story, the second hobbit, Sam, uh, it wouldn't have happened without him. So that that not just the fact that, okay, you deserve whatever you have built and you earned it just as well, but also seeing the value in that position. That's something which which was and probably is still uh, a little complicated for me to to grasp, but I'm working in that direction. That's good. It's good. And I, I think you're 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 totally right because you know, even if you look at say sports, for example, you know, you'll always see like the team and there's always that star athlete, but then there might be a crucial role or an individual in that team that might not necessarily get the praise or the actual recognition that they deserve or they're perceived to, but they're so crucial in making that team work together. Um, the interesting thing that I want to know is because obviously for me, I, I can understand that from growing up, you know, it's always about being assertive, being independent. I have a set path that I'm supposed to go down and that's what's ingrained in my childhood. I think that's then lodged in my subconscious. But then I've always thought by starting my own business, then, you know, I have to be the front and center of this. Do you think that say people who are, you know, working in organizations or they are starting or their work or they're um, developing a business with say their friends, for example, do you think that there is a way of helping them to embrace that? You know, you don't have to be front and center, but you are crucial. Um, Is there anything that could be shared that can help people, um, you know, embrace that they don't have to be the limelight or the, you know, the star of the show and on everything that you see regarding that business. It is a it is a complicated thing to answer because the truth is that uh, I could say anything I want and you could have a supportive environment, but it is up to you. Do you believe in that? Yeah. And I have a very supportive team who uh, I got this girl on my team who came and she started telling me that I'm a star and I was laughing first, but then I realized that, that she's taking it seriously and it's not a joke for her. So the thing is that, yes, she was there to remind me of that, but do I believe in this? It doesn't really matter what the world tells me. Does the world appreciate my second position or not? That's not the question. The question is, can I appreciate my second position? I am, am I content with that? Is that what I want? And uh, here, of course, a lot of us have egos uh, at play. So it's not necessarily just an ambition because you can satisfy ambition by creating something. Like if you're building a cathedral, you're obviously not doing it by yourself, but you can satisfy ambition knowing that you were part of the process. Uh, in a smaller team, it's a little harder harder, especially I used to have a business partner before and she didn't want to be in the limelight. She was afraid of the camera. So she asked me to take the position and I did. And at that time, initially, when there was no um, no benefits uh, were not attached to that, it was mostly the, the work that needed to be done. Somebody needed to summon the courage and, and, and be in front of the camera and do the things that the other one didn't want to do. Uh, in, initially, she felt she was uh, in the good position because she didn't have to do the job. But then with years, of course, she wanted the limelight as well. And uh, it was already a little late. And I've seen that in other in, in other tandems as well. It's a little harder when there are, there's a group of people and someone is naturally uh, attracting more attention or maybe is a little bit more car- brave or outspoken or has better charm at, on stage. It happens. And there is always that... Um, it, the conflict can be in there. And uh, as much as I can give you advice, the thing is that it is up to you to be at peace with your position. I am not the kind of person who can thrive being invisible. For me, second position is tough because I'm by nature much more of a, I need to be in the limelight. Mm. That means that I should look for people who are okay being in the supportive position with me. So if that's if that's part of the business, or if that's part of the business models model, it is good 
to discuss that early on and to be at peace with, with, with the choice that you're making. But I've seen a lot of tandems like that where initially the shy person uh, is happy that they don't have to be in the limelight. They don't have to take the risk. And later they, they want the attention and it just, it just doesn't work anymore. So um, it is, it is still, I have this theory uh, that whatever your conflict with the world is, it's actually not with the world, it's with yourself. So if you have a problem with your business partner or with the audience in general, mm. it is not because they do say uh, something to you or they act in a certain way. It is because of uh, whatever the action, uh, actions or words or thoughts are, they trigger something in you. Mm. So... The truth is that if you, actually, it's my version of truth. <laughs> if you figure out your relationships with yourself, then your relationship with the world will fall in place. So if I had issues with, uh, let's say, vision not paying attention to me or not, um, or not highlighting me enough or not thanking me publicly or not, you know, not taking me to the limelight, it wasn't really my problem with him. It was my problem with me. Why is that a problem for me? Mm. Or why, why I'm in the situation where I'm experiencing that. So it was about me fixing, fixing my attitude to being second. Do I live with, in peace with that or do I change something and I become first? Yeah, I, I think I understand what, what you mean. Do, do you think that transformation then starts really with, um, with self-awareness and really analyzing yourself to figure out before you make these bold moves or if you're looking to change or do something completely independent that you've never done before, instead of just going straight into it and then potentially having repercussions in the long run is starting with yourself first to figure out this could be the route that I'm going down. This, this could be the path that I end up, but I need to figure out if I'm solely happy with the outcomes, if I just go gung ho straight into it. You know, I would say there, there are, again, different angles uh, to approach that question. And one thing is super important. You cannot solve your problems into the future. I mean, you could try. And of course, business people particularly like this because that's we're supposed to be like chess players, you know, see a few moves in the ahead. Uh, but it is also a little bit useless. I love this quote by Mark Twain who said, I had 100 problems in my life and 99 of them never happened. And that's unfortunately how a lot of us live life. And a lot of people, I've been in personal growth transformation for 18 years. So I've seen a lot of transformation or attempted transformation yeah. <laughs> happen in front of me. So uh, unfortunately, a lot of people uh, who go into transformation and personal growth, they go with a hope that I will do my homework, I'll get my degree in transformation and personal growth, and then I'll enjoy life. It's like we, uh, you know how when we go to university and we get a doctor's degree and then the rest of the life we are a doctor because we've got the degree we've done the studying but the reality of life is not that you get, get a degree and you live with that for the rest of your life things change you keep upgrading so it's the same with personal growth and transformation yes you can you can do all your homework you can get your degree and go into life but you're not going to solve all your problems into the future never mm -hmm. And actually by doing that, yes, there is some level of preparation which needs to be done. But if you keep living, uh, solving your future problems, you're never going to be able to enjoy life because you always, your brain, it's your brain's job to, uh, to keep you protected and safe from danger. So of course it comes up with new scenarios over and over again. So one thing I would strongly recommend is Carpe diem. <laughs> Seriously, don't 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 worry too much about the future. The future is so unpredictable. Life is completely unpredictable. We thought we could predict the future, but uh, beginning of 2020 showed that nothing is ever sh for, for sure. Nothing is ever certain. So what's the point? You, <laughs> the problems that may, may befall you may be very different from what you were solving <laughs> when mm. you were being smart. So that's one thing. But uh, answering your question, what's the most important in transformation, I absolutely agree. I think the most important skill about transformation is awareness. 
That's the skill that needs to, your transformation starts with an awareness. And if anything, I think the, the anatomy of transformation is, is what I'm most fascinated about because that's my, my line of work. So the transformation starts with an awareness, not even with a desire to change anything, not even with knowledge how to change, not even with the action plan, what you want to change. It is awareness. The moment you switch on your awareness, you start noticing how what you're doing right now, your decision right now, uh, affects your future. And that, the awareness, will uh, give rise to motivation to change eventually. So you don't need to go into personal growth with either big pain or huge curiosity. As long as you, if you can switch on the awareness, it will start happening for you. It will be the first piece of the dominoes that will drop. Because what happens is that I'll, I'll just ask a question, not of you particularly, but you can answer if you want, if you like. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I like to ask, how many important questions have, be, have you taken in your life? And when you think about important life altering uh, decisions, sorry, decisions, I, I said the wrong word. How many important decisions? When you ask, uh, when you start thinking about those huge important decisions, you usually think about a dozen, maybe a handful, right? Uh, what to study, what profession to start, start or not start a business, get married or not, and so on. It's, it's a dozen usually. But my theory is that life is not shaped with those decisions. Because if you look at people who have taken very similar decisions to you or have similar background, your quality of life may be very different. You, the way you spend your free time, the way you enjoy it, the way you interact, the way your connection is with, you, with your family, it, it may be very different despite your important decision. So the, important, the, the question which I, I am going to ask now finally is, how many decisions do you think you take a day? It's a tricky question. Oof. I mean, if this is directed at me personally, I think 10, 10, 10, de- yeah, it's maybe 10 decisions. But then again, I don't know whether that's... Where to draw the line about decision, right? Yeah. I don't know whether, where the decisions are based externally, whether they're, you know, other people asking about, you know, me making a decision or it's me trying to make a decision internal, based on internal what I'm decisions. Thinking. I mean, internal decisions, not external. Oh, internal decisions. Oh my gosh. Endless. I, I just think because yes. I'm always thinking about the podcast, what can I do? Um, I'm, I'm trying to make decisions about the website, which I'm um, rebranding. I'm rebranding the business at the moment and work. So I've, I've, I would say I'm, I've lost count, Christina. I think maybe 50 plus, I don't know, a day. You, you just made quite a few in just this uh, short period, by the way. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, scientists, scientists have not agreed on that number, but it goes anywhere between a few thousand to 35,000. That depends on how deep you go, because even moving a hand is a decision on some level. Of course, uh, it's, we, we, we are not going to talk about this kind of decisions, but there is also such a thing as a decision fatigue. That's why we are a little conscious of how many decisions we take. So sometimes when we have, um, let's say, meetings where we decide strategic questions, then we get tired. It's because mm-hmm. we take actively decisions. But the thing is that we take decisions all the time throughout the day. And I'm talking about decisions, say, uh, when you wake up, um, what do you do? Do you snooze? Do you get off the bed straight away? Uh, when uh, you feel hungry, breakfast is usually on autopilot. Brushing teeth is usually on autopilot. But let's say when you uh, when you get hungry in the middle of the day, do you go and have a lunch or a meal, or do you snack something? How do you snack? Do you take um, something healthy? Do you take a chocolate? Right uh, now, if we go deeper, somebody says something to you. How do you react? Not even your words. How do you feel? Your emotion is being triggered. How do you you react to your emotion? There are so many decisions throughout the day. It's ridiculous. And the thing is that because we have decision fatigue, we uh, start, we we, we move on autopilot. It is is a necessary thing because otherwise you will get nuts. You You have to automate things so that you can keep your capacity, your mental capacity a little bit more free for important things, for decisions which are a little bit more active. So what happens is that we go on autopilot and that means that we react in the same way to the same situations. And when it comes to how you wash yourself, how you dress and how you eat, it's okay especially if you have healthy habits. And a lot of people who listen to your podcast probably have uh, fairly healthy traditions and habits and rituals. 
But we also fall on autopilot when it comes to stressful situations, to painful situations, to conflicts with people, to interaction with people. We fall into the same patterns over and over again because autopilot is just so much more sparing in our brain. That's why I say that uh, awareness is the most important practice because if you live a day with full awareness, let's say you put alarm clock that reminds you every half an hour to be aware. And every half an hour, I am ex exaggerating right now, I would never suggest anyone do that, but say every half an hour, uh, you, you're reminded that you are to be aware and you stop in that moment when your alarm goes and you ask, what am I doing right now? What decision am I taking and how is it going to affect me in the future? Like even small decisions, are you going to take an elevator or walk up the stairs? You don't even think about that stuff. But if you start thinking, you suddenly realize that if you just switched elevator for stairs, which will take exactly the same time, but will exercise you more, it's actually going to add some movement to your life. And in the long run, it's massive improvement from a small change. So that, that interesting habit, it, just switching it on changes a lot in your life and you don't even need to live properly. Like you switch on autopilot, I don't ask you to eat healthy, exercise better, and not react to, to painful conflicts. All I'm just saying is that just notice and don't say that you're doing something wrong. Just notice you will find motivation to suddenly start changing things out of nowhere. And uh, another very important thing to add, I'm sorry, it's a, it's a longish answer. To add to I that is that <laughs> change doesn't happen as a heel turn. Unfortunately, because we're used to this, this uh, picture or this idea of change happen from pain, especially marketers like this, you have to, you know, you have to find the pain that keeps you awake at night and then work on that. And then, of course, when people come from pain into personal growth and transformation or into any problem solving, they are so fired up to change everything. You know, if you, if you need to change your health habits, you are going to uh, set up a, a gym membership straight away, start eating well, uh, buying your own groceries, cooking your own food, sleeping well, and all this stuff. And you will have, because you come from pain, you will have motivation for a while. But it's very overarching, big motivational chunk. And it will start, eventually, you will have to switch on willpower. And this kind of heel turns never work because that motivation is too overarching. It's not even intrinsic. Your motivation to eat well and your motivation to exercise will actually need to be different. It's not, I want to be healthy. I want to be healthy. It's like an elephant. It's not functional. So you will need to change. First of all, you will be losing motivation. So you will depend on willpower. And willpower is not a long-term strategy. So what I've noticed in all those years in personal growth, that the things that change your life the most are incremental little changes. Incremental changes which are sustainable, which work on intrinsic, intrinsic as in motivation in doing things. You don't need external motivation. You are doing things because you want to do them. And, uh, and for that, all you need is awareness. Yeah. Honestly, I absolutely love it because I think that a lot of, well, myself, but a lot of the people that I speak with, they just naturally live their days by the same set of routines. And yet they complain when their life isn't getting better or it isn't improving. But yet there needs to be a change somewhere to make that transformation begin and i think that i love i love your answer about self-awareness because it's just and, and i hope that the listeners are finding this as valuable as i am as i'm hearing it myself i just I, what i'm curious to know is with your the seven days to happiness which i'm going to put links into the description so people can get involved and 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 book with you for the course there is something in there that I'm very curious about is embracing negativity in a healthy <laughs> way. And that, that kind of pricked my ears up a little bit because I was thinking, well, aren't we supposed to get away from negativity? <laughs> How do we do this? I'm, I'm sorry if, it, if it's part of, or it's a secret answer that you've got to sign up to the course then. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a secret. It shouldn't be a secret. Well, first of all, I want to uh, tell you that you translated what I said into your own um, through your own prism right now, because I'm not saying about negativity, actually. Uh, you, uh, you know, it, it might have landed on you this way. I'm talking about pain, which is a little different from negativity. Um, although I don't, uh, I don't um, condone negativity per se. I mean, 
we all like to whine from time to time. <laughs> I just had a little bit of a tough moment before starting this interview because I just got tired of, of uh, you know, I speak in Russian audience quite a lot and they're so, so um, demanding when it comes to, f first of all, they're incredibly misogynist. <laughs> Sorry for those who are from Russia, if you're listening, but it's true. <laughs> Russia desperately needs feminism. But also they're so demanding on, on females' uh, appearance that I just got, just today, I got so tired of being constantly criticized for our look. I really had a, uh, a moment of, of uh, enjoying a little bit of self-loathing. But <laughs> it, it was a moment. So come to your, uh, coming back to your question, uh, it's not a secret and it should be a secret. Uh, and the fact that it is a secret is, uh, is uh, a tragedy of contemporary, pop, uh, of contemporary humankind. Uh, I, I do love uh, this concept that I think it's Brené Brown, but it might be someone else who, who just started talking about toxic positivity. So if you think about toxic positivity, then maybe you can be a little bit... Um, easier on negativity. It is an expression which is not uh, very helpful. It is not uh, very, um, well, it doesn't take you anywhere, but it is an expression that has the right to exist. And we all experience that from time to time. But as I said, I don't talk about negativity usually because I don't believe in judging emotions. In judging your experiences. And when we say something is positive or negative, good or bad, light, dark, there is this judgment in that. So to, to give you an explanation, let's, I, I'll simplify it and I'll talk about emotions because that's easy, easy to understand rather than going into abstract concepts, but it's true actually about a lot of other areas in life as well. So if we take emotions, there are no positive and negative emotions. There are no good, no bad emotions. Emotions just are. Why? Because like with the physical body, I like to compare emotions to physical body. So our physical body has sensations, physical sensations. And some of the sensations we call pain and we don't like them. There is a, a medical condition called um, something analgesia. I don't remember the actual con congenital analgesia, an analgesia, I think it's called. And uh, that condition means that a hum the person doesn't feel physical pain. So people with that condition who don't feel physical pain, they die young. Because what happens is that uh, the, the pain, uh, our body gives a pain signal to, to draw our attention to the part that requires either, either um, it's a wound and you have to remove yourself and heal it, or it's, it's some kind of ailment, uh, some, some sickness that you have to heal. So people with analgesia, they don't feel pain and they don't notice how their body deteriorates. It's very simple. They can bite oh, off their wow. tongue and not notice it. Oh so gosh. their body breaks and, and, and deteriorates without them noticing because their body doesn't give them a pain signal. So we live in the world, and personal growth has done a lot of contribution to that of emotional analgesia. We glorify positive emotions, so-called positive emotions, emotions which are pleasurable. And we vilify emotions which are unpleasant. But just like with a physical body, our emotional body, if I can call it so, also has different sensations to draw our attention to different parts of our life that require our attention. And if you have emotional analgesia, what happens is that you don't pay attention to areas that require your attention. So let's say if you're feeling an emotion, the thing is that emotion is not really under your control. And I know in personal growth, we have this whole thing like, oh, you are in control of your life. Yes, you're in control how you react to your emotion. You're in control. Are you going to act out of your emotion or you're going to just notice it, say thank you and move on? That you are in control of, but you're not in control of what you feel. So if you feel something, say anger, not, I'm not saying sadness or pain, I'm saying anger or disgust or revenge. The things that most of us good girls and good boys don't feel, don't want to feel because come on, this is not enlightened. This is not transformed. This is beneath me. But the thing is that if you feel, for example, contempt or jealousy, you feel it. It's like pain in your physical body. It is given to you to notice and to pay attention. And if you reject it because you have emotional analgesia or because you think it's beneath you, emotion doesn't disappear anywhere. Emotions are like water in the river. 
If you obstruct the flow of the river, they will get stuck and they will start sinking. So the same thing with emotions. If you don't allow the emotion to express itself, to carry its information for you, what will happen is that it will not disappear. It will get stuck in you. Either in your subconscious, well, it gets stuck in subconscious. I actually don't know the uh, anatomy of emotions well enough, but it it, it gets stuck in be, below your consciousness. And there are two options. Either it's going to explode totally in a place and time when it's absolutely unnecessary. It will be an explosion, emotional explosion, which is in a wrong place and in a wrong way. Or you're going to be doing emotional leakage. Uh, passive aggressive behavior is very often an example of emotional leakage. I don't want to go into explaining that because most people mm. know what's passive aggressive behavior. So the point is that there are no positive and negative emotions. There are no good and bad emotions. There are emotions. Every one of them has the right to be. Every one of them has a message for you. The thing is that you have to learn how to deal with those emotions and you have control whether you let them uh, take over you or you, mm. or, or, or you can acknowledge, accept, you know, learn from them, and then act out of your values, let's say. And that's, that's what I'm talking about. I do not talk about negativity. And there is place for everything. If you feel like whining, there is a reason for that. Give yourself that permission for a while and then move on from there. Don't get stuck. Uh, but I do talk about a very simple, very simple reality of life. Pain is part of life. It's going to happen. You might as well learn how to work with it. Wow. Do you know what? I, I, I found that so fascinating. And um, I don't know if you've read it, but I'm, I'm going through the, the chimp paradox because I want to understand my emotions and the, the differences obviously between the limbic and the, and the prefrontal cortex, why I feel these emotions and how can I manage them better. And there is a section in chimp paradox where it states that you should treat your emotions like you're a therapist, just let it moan. And after 10 minutes, it will just tire itself. And then you can start thinking logically from the prefrontal cortex so that you can then manage these more, more effectively. And I'm, I'm, I just find what you're saying completely fascinating. And just I'm on my own quest to figure out how I can, <laughs> how I can manage my emotions better, but also not um, be kind of well, just just going into toxic positivity, I guess, because I think that that's also not not healthy. And yeah, I just find that so fascinating. Um, what else can people expect from the seven days of of happiness, Christina? Well, that's that's that is piece of theory, not from seven days of happiness. Actually, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, I I actually like what you just said about as a, about the book that you are you're reading. It is. It, it is right. I have my own um, algorithm of working with immediate emotions, but it is, I, I call it emotional first aid. So what you're talking about r literally refers, you know, when emotion has done its job, it's free to move on. It doesn't have to start, uh, stay. It's And that's a very deep philosophical concept, although it's based in psychology, but it's a deep philosophical concept because there is another thing where you have your journey and you have to go through that. And often if you're sidetracked of your journey, your journey is going to catch up with you, uh, whether you like it or not. So emotions in a less philosophical way work the same way. If you don't experience it, it's, it will catch up with you sooner or later. But in Seven Days to Happiness, I do give uh, a much simpler theory. It's a, it's a very beginner program as in I, I wrote it long time ago and um, I, I still like the, the uh, techniques that I give there but the, the premise there is simple is although if we were to touch about happiness we'd have to go deep into the conversation but basically I maybe approach, another time for sure because I'm, I'm really enjoying this conversation <laughs> thank you I approach happiness as a habit as a skill as a muscle you can exercise not as an emotion, because emotion by nature is uh, fluid. It changes, right? So I approach it as a state, as a skill, as a habit. Uh, and because of uh, because I approach it this way, I give uh, a set, actually it's seven uh, practices, seven out of, you can come up with more, to uh, increase your set points of happiness uh, over a long period of time. So they're not immediate gratification type of mechanisms. Like for me, immediate gratification is having a piece of chocolate <laughs> or venting to a friend. <laughs> this is immediate gratification. So the techniques that I give are much more long-term, so they're not as intensely effective. But if you practice them for a long time, uh, they will make you feel 
better. And some of them are super simple. Everybody knows about them, such as gratitude exercise, uh, being in the present moment. But some of them are uh, more um, challenging, uh, like uh, forgiveness exercise. We go deep into forgiveness. And I do give a very uh, sm- short, like there's one mo- module where I talk about um, uh, dealing with pain. So similar to what I was talking about right now, but I go more into uh, an actual technique of what to do with a, with a painful experience, uh, not so much the, the overall theory of that. So uh, that's, that's what the program is about. But I want to say one more thing because we talked about that. You know, even the positive practices, um, you know, they lose their edge. And I think that's another uh, misfortune of uh, of uh, contemporary world. We live in this bite sized world, and we're so used to surface level everything and the facades that we uh, have untrained to go deeper and look into the essence of things. I'm bilingual by birth, and they say that bilingual kids, and there are a lot of bilingual kids around the world, by the way, two thirds of the population apparently. We understand a very interesting concept, which is much harder to understand for people who are monolingual. That means is that the same thing. Like I have a cup here, for example, depending on your system in which, uh, from which system you're looking at it will have a different label. Mm -hmm. And because we understand that concept, I'm used to go beyond the label into the depth of the phenomenon. And a lot of the... uh, a lot of the times the problem with the personal growth practices is that they're very simple and ritualistic and a little bit, I'm sorry, a little bit dogmatic and a little bit mindless. And I am in this industry, so <laughs> I've made a living out of promoting these practices. The problem with them is that they they are very often geared to be like a magic pill. And we use them as a magic pill, which is good at an initial stage. It makes you break the mold a little bit, break the pattern and start seeing things differently. When you start exercising gratitude, you do see the world a little different you suddenly think like oh yes there is so much to be grateful for but the thing is that with anything there is such thing as hedonic adaptation which means that the more you do something the more you get used to that the less it has uh, influence on you so take any practice whether it's meditation yoga uh, gratitude exercise if you stay on the surface level and the facade level and you do that for the sake of doing that and it becomes ritualistic it becomes a habit and you do it on autopilot it starts losing the itch because mm-hmm. you have stopped going deep inside and seeing why do you, why specifically do you do that? And that's that's one of the things that I wanted to caution. Uh, you, I somehow believe your audience is so much more advanced than normally. <laughs> so, <laughs> because, because you see this autopilot, it's not only dangerous when you have bad habits that run you, like my habit of eating chocolate when I feel stressed, but yeah. it also starts being dangerous when you have good habits and they stop having an effect on you. And then you end up in a very similar situation to mine. You have a perfectly Instagrammable life where you do all the right things. You have all the right habits. You exercise, you have good health, you eat well, you have good job. You you don't have any conflicts with people, but it becomes plastic and it's like a shell with nothing inside because it's this superficial, you know, you lose the edge, you stop seeing the juice. Mm. Which is why I'm a huge advocate of just letting life be and not being so damned perfect. Love because it. sometimes you need you need the dark to enjoy the light. You need the cold to enjoy the warmth. And you need the pain to enjoy the bliss from time to time. I love it. I honestly love it. Christina, honestly, it's been absolutely amazing speaking with you. And do you know what? I really, really want to have another conversation with you because I feel that there, there were parts where you were talking and I was thinking, oh my God, I want to go deeper into this. I want to go deeper into that. Thank you. <laughs> That's such it's a pleasure. Brilliant. No, it's honestly, it's great. What's, um, what is next for you? I'm uh, finishing the manuscript of my first book and the perfectionist is kicking in. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> But I hope I will be done uh, by the end of the year, and I'll, I'll, I'll hope I'll publish it. That's that's. Uh, I have two big projects. One is a book. The other one is a private personal project. <laughs> so these are the two big things in my life right now. Oh my gosh! Well, do you know what? I I wish you all the best with whatever you. you're doing, and I cannot wait to honestly hear about the book. And I know that you're sourcing the ins and outs, the final bits, the title, um, but. Yeah, honestly, watch this space, everybody. Like, I really, really cannot wait for this to be published. Thank you so much.
Amazing. Well, Christina, I really, really do appreciate you being a guest on this week's episode. And I really, really want to continue this conversation on another time as well and covering so many more topics that literally I think we've just scratched the surface of. But if you want to know more, Christina, how can we get in contact with you and and obviously learn and from you and from your wisdom and everything? So um as a co-founder of Mind Valley, I would say come to Mind Valley. <laughs> because yeah. apart from me, you'll find a whole lot of amazing teachers there and occasionally me. Uh, if you want me personally, then I have an Instagram account where I'm super active. I do usually uh, copy posts in uh, in other social medias as well, but Instagram is where where it's me personally most of the time. Amazing. Okay, well, I have links to your Instagram and I will share that as well. But honestly, thank you so much. It's been really, really great speaking with you. And yeah, I've just, I've been more of a listener than actual host this episode, just learning and taking everything in. So yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. (laughs) Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.